Lifeline is a player whose rise to the top has not been normal in any way. With its speed unmatched and its controversy coming from the almost complete lack of it. It's the story of one of the most singular, and yet most normal players to touch Osu. And it's also one that's pretty fascinating in its own right. This is a story of Lifeline, the man who single tapped his way to the top. Lifeline first got into Osu in the most classic way, when one of his friend's brothers told him that it would improve his aim at CSGO. This is BS, but like so many others, by the time he realized this, it was already too late. But there was good reason that he got so into the game. Because he was having immense success. Like, he got to 5 digit within 4 months of starting. Mainly through pretty farming maps, but that's still crazy fast. This momentum wouldn't last forever though, as pretty soon after he cracked 5 digit, he would break his left wrist, stopping him from playing for 2 months. At first, this seems like an obviously bad thing but it had proved to mean something very different. This is because while before the break he had struggled with single tapping anything over 200, he was now able to play things that were almost unheard of at his rank. And this is where he truly began getting going, since after realizing this he started dedicating way more time to the game and improving at an even faster rate. He would get his first 400 on Hawes' extra difficulty on Chica Chica, which would be his first of many over the next months. Since the pure volume of scores that he was putting out, along with his already absurd improvement rate, made his climb up the rankings one that few can match, with it somehow only taking him 4 months to go from 4 to 3 digits, since he was legitimately able to get his first 5 and 600 as a 4 digit. Since after playing for multiple hours a day, his rank still couldn't keep up at the rate Even while playing for multiple hours a day, his rank just couldn't keep up at the rate at which he was improving. This meant it wouldn't take long for him to get to the top of 3 digits, where he would once again set a score that seemed unreal for a player of his rank, when he would FC last goodbye for nearly 800 pp. This was finally to the point where his scores were unignorable. This would mean that he'd get some posts on r slash osu game, which would cause there to be a bunch of people who decided he was hacking, since obviously no one could improve faster than them, and especially since before this time he hadn't gotten that much attention, the people who called him a hacker seemed extremely loud. Luckily, these allegations would never become a massive problem, but the attention sort of would. This is because Lifeline had gotten to an extremely high rank within a year and a half of playing, and so he was lacking many of the skills that other players at his rank had. This is made clear when he got all the way to the top 100, with multiple 700 PP plays, and yet he would fail to get even a single number one score. To be completely fair, any player getting a number one score after just a year and a half of playing would be really impressive. But especially when his main skill was one of the most popular in the entire game, he had very few opportunities. This wouldn't stop people from being just kind of annoying about it though. Because Lifeline had committed a cardinal sin, becoming high up in the PP rankings by being good at farming PP. I could hear society collapsing around me as I say that sentence. It's just so absurd. The thing to me about this is that while Lifeline himself and a lot of other people agreed that he was overranked at the time, it makes a lot more sense to blame the system than the player. Especially since, during his fairly short career, Lifeline had achieved an absurd amount, but it just focused on what he enjoyed doing. But this wasn't what many saw, and at a certain point it got to be so much that he really tried to quit. He would pull an Osu player moment and come back fairly shortly after though. But you can definitely see a point in time where there was an extremely significant decrease in plays. Luckily, this wouldn't last forever though, as he would start coming back with his new top play on Sotarx's songs comp worth almost 800 pp, before laying low for a couple of weeks and then setting two top plays within 12 hours, both being well over 800 pp. One of these was the number one on the map, and the other was a number one choke. Basically, this is the moment where his farming ability and single tapping ability were finally able to set him apart as a player. This is also just a few days before he'd get the number 4 score on Magma by single tapping, which represents pretty well just how quickly he could do it. And I would say the single tapping speed was almost sort of a representation of his extremely high skill ceiling, since even top 5 players would struggle with this kind of speed. And it would only keep getting better as time went on. This would also combine with his aim, which had only been getting better exponentially. And by this point, 800 had stopped being a rarity and become almost a new norm for him, taking him to the top of the game. And this would all combine with the ranking of what may be the most egregious farm map in the game. 
Fiery's anime ban, which he would FC on the day of its ranking for his first 900pp, which also got him into the top 20. It's crazy, but even at the point where he was getting his first 900, he was still underranked because of just how quickly he was improving. And at this point, his farming skill made him top 10 material easily. And he would prove this, since he never slowed down. And pretty soon after getting his first 900, he was getting high 800s with an unheard of frequency. Right after this, his 3 mod skill would also get to the point where he'd start 3 modding absurd maps, which would get him his second 900, which is 970, and a bunch of different high 800s. This would get him all the way to rank 14. But the only weird thing was that despite being in the top 15 at this point, he was nearly unknown by everyone. This is because his plays still didn't stand out despite his aim being one of the best in the world, with only 3 number 1 scores. This meant that the number of people calling him a DT1 trick wouldn't go down, but instead, with even more attention, it would just happen more often. The thing is, it's impossible to change your skill set in a day. So while he would start branching out at this point, it would take a while before it started to show. But his aim certainly wasn't getting any worse, since he would just keep going and start getting DT and 3 mod 900s, and a fair few number one scores as well. His branching out would also start to show just in time for OWC, where he'd be able to prove that he did have tournament skill, since while just months prior he would have a bad performance in a small tournament against many players far lower ranked than him, in OWC he would end up helping his team get to within one point of beating Germany, and also all the way to beating the UK, with Indonesia having one of its best runs ever. This was certainly in big part thanks to players like Skydiver and RHO, who came out as some of the best players in the entire tournament. But saying Lifeline didn't pull his weight would just be plain wrong. And recently, he discovered that he could actually play DT only better than Hidden Double Time, and started pumping out scores that were nothing like what he could do even just weeks prior. And his improvement arc for everything, including DT, still has certainly not ended. He says he plans to play more tournaments, as well as focus a huge amount on speed. And seeing how much he's improved at both over just the last few months, it seems like we won't be seeing the end of Lifeline anytime soon. Especially after seeing things like a single tapping speed, which might point to an absurdly high skill cap. Which is really exciting, seeing as he's one of the most dedicated players in the game right now. And with his place on the leaderboard being so high already, it's going to be pretty exciting to see how he might be able to change other parts of the game. It's impossible to know what the future holds for Lifeline, which I think makes him pretty exciting.